We want to continue with these fundamental messages concerning the church of which you read in your New Testament. I recognize that they're very basic and first principle. But no matter how deeply you go into the study of the Bible, the more meatier matters of God's truth will always be based upon these fundamentals and first principles. Today I would like to talk about in the identification of the church of which you read in your own New Testaments. Matters that pertain to what is the final authority that we appeal to to determine whether we're saved or not saved, whether we're serving God faithfully. How does God direct us? How does He lead us? How do we learn what is right and wrong in His sight? Now in previous installments we've studied the following New Testament identifying marks of the church that Jesus built. We saw how it was founded on a scriptural builder who is Jesus Christ himself. And it was founded on the scriptural foundation, that is, that Christ is the Son of God. And it was founded in the scriptural place, the city of Jerusalem, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. We see, too, that Christ is the founder of only one. One church, and that is his church. When those people obeyed the gospel and being baptized into Christ, having first believed in him and repented of their sins, they were baptized, immersed in water by his authority for the remission of sins. And Christ added them to his church. That is the church to which we want to be a part of and none other. We also learned about the scriptural name of the church, and we emphasized their terms of designation for the body of Christ, the body of Christ being one of them. So there are several terms of designation, scriptural terms of designation. And we uh, talk about the churches of Christ salute you, as Paul wrote by inspiration to the church at Rome in Romans 16, 16. Now, there are other terms, church of God and so forth, but that term is very plain and very explicit, showing the relationship of the saved to the Savior, and the Savior to the saved. We also noted in our last time together on this general study the scriptural organization of the church. And we want to always follow that. If you go into a community where the Lord's church does not exist and you preach the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, people here believe and obey the gospel, then the Lord adds them to his church. Thus, they are to serve God faithfully in the church, and when they organize themselves, the Bible has something to say about that. So a scripturally organized church is a church with elders and deacons and teachers and preachers, and each member seeking first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto them, Matthew 6, 33. Now I say again in this installment, we want to note that the New Testament church has the Bible. The Bible as its only rule of faith and practice, or it's the only confession of faith. And thus, we ought to want to know that the Bible must be rightly divided or handled rightly, 2 Timothy 2.15, as we study it. Now, there are a great many people out there who study the Bible every day, and they'll say it's the Word of God, and they're studying it to learn God's will. Well, that's good as far as it goes. But they don't know a thing in the world about handling a right or rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's as important as reading your Bible every day. If you don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, you may go to the book of Deuteronomy and say, well, how does Christ save me? Let me study this book and learn. But you won't find the answer in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, or anywhere in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealing the unfolding of God's scheme of redemption. And as Paul wrote in Galatians 4 and verse 4, in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son. We do not do any violence of the Scriptures to say that also in the fullness of time God established His church. Read about it in the inspired Luke's account in Acts chapter 2. Now, we should never be a member of any religion that has a human rule of faith and practice. There is a reason we have the Bible. And if we're going to do as we please, why ever study the Bible? 
Why ever even give lip service to it as the Word of God? When we say it's the Word of God, that implies there is a God and we are His creature and we need His direction and that's only found in the Bible. Thus, we urge each other in the church to read your Bibles. Meditate on what it says. Make an honest, objective application to your life. That is the only way anybody can ever become a Christian or live faithful in the Lord's church. When the apostles were alive, and for the first three centuries in the last millennium, the Bible was the only rule of faith. Now, that doesn't mean that people didn't start departing from it. Paul warns of that while the Bible's even being written. But there was a long period of time when people departed from it. They did not go out and seek another rule of faith and practice written by men. So why should we not use the same rule of faith today? Because men won't obey it. Because men add to it or subtract from it or alter it in some way doesn't mean that as God gave it, it will not accomplish what God meant for it to. It will accomplish that. If we in honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, are determined to study it and to learn how to study it, 2 Timothy 2, 15, we should not desire some sort of rule of faith and practice similar to similar to the one that existed in the first century, but we must have the same one. Now, that's not the case in denominationalism today. And I pause here to say again that denominationalism is a false concept of the Lord's church. It takes the view that one is saved by Christ in some way or the other from his sins, whatever his concept of sin is, and then... You pick the church that suits you, that fits your needs as you see those needs. But none of that is taught in your New Testament. When people obeyed the gospel, as is plainly recorded in Acts chapter 2, the scripture in explicit terms says the Lord added them to the church. And it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. We have the apostles' doctrine today. Through them, by the Holy Spirit, Jesus gave us his last will and testament. And we're to abide in it. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. We're to judge ourselves and everything else around us, everybody else around us, as to who is right and wrong before God in the light of the rightly divided word of God. Now that rule of faith and practice, the Bible and the Bible only, makes Christians and Christians only. It can't make anything else. It's the seed of the kingdom. And remember that the kingdom and the term church is used interchangeably to mean the same thing. When Christ promised in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. He told Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Well, it wasn't talking about two distinct institutions. He simply uses kingdom because it refers to the body of the saved to teach us one thing about it. And church, in the sense, by the gospel, is called out from the ways of the world when people obey it, having believed it. So we're Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, members of the church of which is revealed only on the pages of the New Testament. The Bible and the Bible only then completely furnishes us unto every good work. People will give lip service to that. Even members of the church will do it until... Something in the Bible hits their pet love and their pet desire and goes against their own will, and then you'll see they'll fall into the same, many times, fall into the same error of those out here in the denominational world. They will proclaim we're under the authority of Christ and only under the authority of Christ is revealed in the Word of God. But then when push comes to shove, you'll find they'll go their way rather than the Lord's way. Peter wrote about the importance of the New Testament being the only authority to direct God's people in 2 Peter chapter 1, 2, and 3. And I remind you that he is writing to Christians. These folks have already heard the gospel. They've already believed it. They've obeyed it. The Lord's added them to the church. And yet he still says to them, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. How? How is God's favor and how is God's peace that only it can give man? How is it going to be multiplied unto us who are members of the church? He says through, now that's an avenue, through the knowledge of God 
and of Jesus our Lord. That's how it works. It won't work any other way. There won't be some sort of very special feeling that makes your hair stand on end. No, it'll come through a logical, objective study of His Word and understanding His will and then bringing your life in subjection to it. He goes on to say in verse 3, according as His divine power, not human power, power from God, God's power. And you don't do any violence to the Scriptures since the Gospel is God's power and the salvation to substitute Gospel for this. It's through His Gospel. It's through His Word. It's through the New Testament. It's through the faith once for all delivered to the saints that we understand what's right and wrong. Notice, according as His divine power hath given unto us what? Some things? Partial? No. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, why would you go anywhere else to find things that pertain to life and godliness? When the inspired apostle Peter said that it is in the power of God, the truth of God, that sets us free, John 8, 31 and 32, that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. Notice again this avenue, this preposition, through. Through what? We're right back to knowledge. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us. How did he call us? By the gospel. Called us to glory and virtue. That's the end of our lives, having lived faithful to the Lord while on this earth. It all comes back to proper knowledge of God's Word and our submission to it. Well, we're all familiar with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, at least I think we are, where Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy needed to know this. Well, you say, didn't he already know it? He's a young preacher. Indeed, he did. But that simply points out this. Though we know something, we need to be reminded of it. And so he said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now, if you don't know your Bible, you don't know the way to heaven. If you don't know your Bible, you don't know how to be saved. You don't know about the church or its relationship to salvation. You won't even understand Jesus Christ. And I'm sad to say that's the case with a great many people. I read something from a person that should have known this a long time ago, and yet they asked a question about a certain matter. And it's been taught on and taught on and taught on, and it's been taught on in their hearing in various ways, yet they still ask the question because they act like they didn't know. Well, that just goes to show me as a teacher of truth for all these years and striving to, striving to live by it, and to defend it and to expose those who speak against it, teach doctrines contrary to it, that people can sit under good teaching, sound teaching. They can have their Bible in their hand all day long every day, but they're not thinking and meditating and studying and writing and dividing the Word of Truth, and thus they don't know the answer to many questions. Human creeds are revised every few years because of their imperfection. No disciple of a human creed knows what his doctrine will be 10 years down the road or maybe five years down the road or maybe a year down the road. Creeds, church manuals, prayer books, catechisms, etc. are constantly being altered and revised. And this alone stigmatizes human creeds because it signifies their weakness and imperfection and the lack of understanding on the part of people who create them and think they ought to abide by them. It shows their lack of faith in the Bible and the Bible only as the only rule of faith and practice, or they wouldn't develop such things. Now, I admit nowadays, as I said many times, that among the denominational churches, fewer of them know about their specific creeds, such as the Baptist Manual or the Methodist Discipline or the Presbyterian uh, Confession of Faith and so on. But the hierarchy knows about them. And when you come to community churches that have risen up over the last 25 years, they're only a hodgepodge of denominations gathered together and built upon God as a Father, Christ as Son of God, man sinned, whatever he thinks sin is, is not good. And uh, therefore, if you call on Jesus to save you, however you think he saves you, uh, believing that you can't do anything to be saved, then you assemble together and pretty much do what all denominations do as they're all gathered together. There's a complete misconception 
complete ignorance of the Bible teaching on the importance of the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. Now, human creeds simply cannot be defended. First of all, notice that any creed containing more than the Bible is objectionable simply because it contains more than the Bible. If you look at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they don't take the Bible and the Bible only. They believe back down the line somewhere it was corrupted. And so God sent the angel Moroni to uh, Joseph Smith and we, we got what they have as the Book of Mormon and they also appeal for their doctrines to the books, Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price and such stuff as that. Well, notice it's the Bible plus Latter-day Revelation, not the Bible only. The same thing's true of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism says the Bible is the Word of God, but you don't know how to study it on your own. You can't understand all God intends without the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church. And so anything that is beside the Bible is not necessary to salvation. Secondly, any creed containing less than the Bible is objectionable. Why? Because it contains less than the Bible. That doesn't seem difficult to understand. Thirdly, any creed differing from the Bible is objectionable. Why? Because it differs from the Bible. Fourthly, any creed precisely, exactly like the Bible is useless. Why? Because we already have the Bible. Thus, human creeds cannot be defended. They've been developed by people who don't really understand the final authority of the Scriptures. So no man can defend his man-made creeds on the grounds I've just given you. And I suggest among members of the church who get into a discussion with people, the first thing you have to do, you must do, is settle what is the final authority in determining right and wrong with people. And this is just a way to show that... Uh, the Bible and the Bible only makes Christians only and the only Christians. You don't need anything else but the Bible. It is found in it, that is, there is found in it, the seed of the kingdom which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. Those who have pledged allegiance to humanly written creeds really cannot defend the Bible. The fact that many religious organizations have creeds reveals at least one thing their lack of faith or confidence or trust in the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. If I were an atheist and I was dealing with anybody that was of the denominational persuasion, that is convinced that creeds and prayer books, etc., are perfectly acceptable as how you live before God correctly, then I would simply ask them, preacher, explain to me why you have some other creed than the Bible if the Bible is complete within itself to lead God and direct people to Christ and to be saved by God through Christ, they can't answer it. You just can't do it. Many, many years ago, a good brother was debating when people were concerned enough to debate what they believed. A fellow, and he was debating the idea of what we're talking about here. And he had a little, I'll borrow this from Gary here a minute. I won't keep it, Gary. He had a little bit of New Testament about that size. He stacked up various creeds, prayer books, catechisms, and manuals of men right here. And the first time he stood before the audience, he looked out and said, I'm affirming on the basis of what the Bible teaches, and the Bible only teaches. And he held a little New Testament up, and he says, little bitty book, we got a great big job. Look at all these stacks of catechisms, etc." And he said that again and looked out at the audience for effect. And he took the little book and he whammed in that stack, scattered creeds all over the front. And he says that's what the Bible does to any man-made institution or any man-made doctrine. Now that uh, impresses people. And then when you go on and teach the truth regarding the final authority of God's word and no need for these things, for honest people searching for the truth, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and all of God's commandments are righteousness, Psalm 119, verse 172, it makes a difference. It breaks through the denominational blinders that people have as to what is the final rule of faith and practice and causes them to go back to the Bible. That they've admitted by lip service that it is the Word of God, but then why don't you abide by it? 
And so we need to do that to ourselves to stay faithful in the church. You know, you don't have to have written down a man-made rule in faith and practice to have one. You can just get to where you do things like you like it, and then you don't realize that, well, that's contrary to the teaching of Christ in the Bible. Thus, there is every day a need to study the Bible and rightly by the word of truth and be honest in the study of it and willing to change anything in your thinking and life that's opposed to it. How else, in fact, as a Christian, no matter how honest you are and sincere, could you ever grow and develop into the likeness of Christ if you didn't do that? So we see that human creeds are divisive. Creeds help, not the only thing, but they help to keep believers in Christ divided into all sorts of parties and sects. Human creeds serve as walls to include and enclose their own adherents and then to exclude others. Well, again, today you'll see that things aren't quite as they were many years ago regarding denominations and how strict they are to abide by their creeds to keep themselves separate from one another. You'll just have to do some studying to see how serious that was back at the time we sought to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. But the way that we started to do it was to point out we all believe one God. We all believe in one Christ. We all believe in one Bible. Well, then why are there all these denominations separated from one another? And they finally said, well, it must be because of the human manuals and prayer books and catechisms and the like. So I say again, we would go a long way down the road to having those who believe in Christ as Savior united if you would get rid of all those things and the influence they have over people as to how to become a Christian and so forth. The church about which all of us read in the New Testament, as I said earlier, believes the Bible to be a book rightly divided or handled aright. That comes, of course, from Paul's admonition to Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a work with it he did not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. Notice word of truth. The truth of God concerning salvation is in the word of God. Thus Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. But we're to rightly divide it. And I said, as I said earlier, I'll say again, many today have little or no true conception of this. They simply don't know what it means to rightly divide or handle right the word of truth. Well, think for a minute. If you believe that it doesn't make any difference what you believe, just so you're sincere in the belief of it, why should you be cautious and careful and specific in studying the Bible, wanting to know particularly what it says? Why look up words? Why understand grammar and how it communicates the will of God to us? Why be that particular? Well, there's no need to be if it's just a matter of, well, I'm sincere in what I believe. God will accept it. If they would really think on this point, they would know that wouldn't be right. So many are just as apt to go to the Psalms, as I said earlier when I mentioned Deuteronomy, in their attempts to learn how to be saved by Christ as they are to go to the book of Acts, which is a book that tells us about the church going into the world to preach the gospel, God's power to save, and their accounts of conversions as they heard believe the gospel, and those some accounts of those who would not be converted because they wouldn't believe the gospel and obey it. But there it is. A whole book in the New Testament that shows the church early on, right? It's on establishment next to, and then going out to sow the seed of the kingdom, and that seed will make Christians and Christians only. Many don't know or they ignore that there are three dispensations in which God has dealt with man, and they're recorded in the Bible. Talk to the average person who may be very dedicated in a denominational church, and they won't know that the Bible reveals a patriarchal dispensation of 2,500 years, it covers from Genesis 1 to 1 to the giving of the law by Moses to the Jews on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. They don't recognize that. And yet that's the father rule period where there was no written law and God dealt with man through the heads of the families. He was their priest and prophet and he was the one that directed religion of that time. So we need to understand that people don't understand that. And they just have to go, as I said earlier, to some book that covers that, such as the book of Genesis, and say, well, if I live like Abraham, I'll be saved. But they fail to remember that 
Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. They fail to remember that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me, John chapter 14 and verse 6. Therefore, when you come down past that time period, the Father Rule period, the patriarchal dispensation, you had the Jewish dispensation. People don't know the difference in the patriarchal and Jewish dispensation. They certainly don't know they exist apart from, in the sense of what they did and who they spoke to and who was amenable to God through them, when it comes to Christianity. The Jewish dispensation, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, Moses made it clear. This law is given to us, even us, not to our fathers, but even us who are all alive here this day. It was never meant to be for everybody. It was meant for God's people through whom Christ would come according to the law and the prophets. So this was man's first written system of religion. It's not a family religion anymore as it was under patriarchy. It was a national religion system of religion. So the Jewish dispensation or Mosaic age had a variety of purposes. People don't recognize that, but it did. We in the church need to understand that if we're to profit in our own personal study of the Bible. You see that one of those purposes was to keep the Jewish nation a distinct race with, um, with Christ as the ultimate outcome of its existence until he could come. Galatians 3, Paul wrote, Verses 16 through 19, there you have plain language that says that's what it was for. It was called the middle wall of partition. Why? Because it separated Jew from Gentile. Ephesians 2.14. That was to keep God's name alive in the world. They were, in effect, as one preacher said, the sheriff of God on earth. As they were faithful, God used them to deal with the heathen nations. When they weren't faithful, God punished them, but they still had that obligation charged upon them. The law, according to Hebrews 10 and verse 1, was a shadow of good things to come. It pointed to the Christ and his last will and testament. Paul argues that in Galatians 3 verse 24, how that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So in the unfolding of God's great scheme of redemption to save man, the law had its place. It was to cause men to realize that by a pure law system you can't be saved because when you transgress the law, you die by a pure law system. And so it made man look to Christ. It made man look to the mercy extended by God through the gospel system. The law was not intended to be used for man's salvation. Listen to how the Hebrews writer wrote, in the first four verses of Hebrews 10, remembering that he wrote to Jews who had become Christians but were being tested right now in their faith and they were actually thinking about giving up the New Testament system. And there the writer says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. He's reasoning with these people who have been converted. They were Jews. They knew what the law was. But they had misconceived things. And due to being persecuted because of their belief and obedience to the gospel... They were actually saying, we'll go back. Well, when you go back, you're leaving the perfect. You're leaving where God was headed in patriarchy and the law of Moses. It was pointing to Christ and his gospel. So it was never intended to be preached to all the world and to every creature to save men from their sins. Never wasn't intended to do that. And you'll never find taught in the scriptures anything about some sort of mosaical plan of salvation. It just is not there. So it was intended to be temporary. It was to last until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Galatians 3.19. And then Paul concludes in chapter 3.16, that seed is Jesus. Then the last one, the Christian dispensation and understanding what it is basically, to rightly divide or handle right the word of truth. This was the new covenant of which Jeremiah spoke. 
in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. He forecasted that. And the inspired writer of the Hebrews declared the same in Hebrews chapter 8. And there the writer said, beginning in verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, now this is quoting I, uh, Jeremiah, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not. He goes on, for this is the covenant that I will make with those with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now listen to his conclusion. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Again he's quoting from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. And here's an inspired commentary on the meaning of the prophet. So many hundreds of years who wrote this. The change of priesthoods also necessitated the change of laws. And that's his reasoning over in chapter... Um, 7 and verse 12 of Hebrews. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now our Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest under the new priesthood. He plainly says so in Hebrews 9 and verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, of this building. And we find out from Peter's writing he addresses Christians in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that each member of the church, each Christian, is a priest approaching God through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Thus, since the priesthood was changed, the law had to be changed as well. Jesus came then to take away the first that he may establish the second, Hebrews 10 and verse 9. The New Testament did not become operative until after the death of of Jesus Christ. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. For where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now what does that do to people who say, well, I can be saved just like Christ saved the thief? No, you can't. While Christ was alive, his will was manifested concerning who he could save. But our Lord's dead and returned back to heaven. And you don't hear anything from here anymore except through the words of the New Testament of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. If I'm going to know who Christ saves and how he saves anybody, or when he saves anybody, I must rightly divide the word of truth and understand that his final authority is set out in the words of the New Testament. Now, it's this last part of our lesson that seems to be where a lot of people, even members of the church, have missed it as to knowing just how to write and divide the word of truth or at least explain what they believe. And that's because we don't spend enough time studying it and meditating on it like the Bible says we should. Now, in closing, we, as we study the will of God, attempting to ascertain His will for us at any time, we must realize what covenant we are under and under what covenant a certain commandment was given or a certain thing allowed. This is a major problem with many in the religious world. And as ignorant as people are even in the church of the Bible and rightly dividing it, it is a problem even here with us. Remember how the epistle of Hebrews began. God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath made heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. 
Thus, we have seen in this study about the New Testament church another identifying mark of the church of Christ. It has the Bible as its only creed, confession of faith, or church member, a manual, a rule of faith. And it believes the Bible is a book to be right to divide it. Anybody that's a Christian has had to understand these things to become a Christian. And anybody that grows in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ has had to use these things to keep on growing. I say again, as I said in the beginning, these first principles, these fundamentals, must be well in hand, or we shall not get the more media matters of God's truth regarding maturing in Christ in the way that they ought to be. If you're not a child of God this morning, we humbly beg you by the mercies of Christ to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You do that by receiving with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You then are instructed to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ as Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And complete your obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Mark 16, 16. Colossians 2, 12. Romans 6, 3, and 4. 1 Peter 3, and verse 21, and so on. The scriptures are clear. Our problem many times is that we just don't have the interest to study them and incorporate, into our, incorporate them into our lives. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. If as a child of God you have sinned, there's a second law of pardon. To repent of those sins, confess them and pray God for forgiveness. So now we offer this invitation of God and it's authorized to be offered, offered to you. If you need to obey either one, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.